George Washington Carver has been an icon for overcoming adversity since the 1800s. From being the sickly child of a slave right after the end of the Civil War, to becoming the first African American to ever get a Bachelor's of Science degree, Carver dedicated himself to improving agriculture throughout the United States. It was his work that saved many of the cotton plantations across the South, converting a lot of them into peanut farms. His work with the legume would lead to over 300 peanut-based inventions, and cement his name in history as the Peanut Man. But while that's how he's often remembered, there's so much more to his story than peanuts. So stick around as we learn something new. A woman named Mary was purchased in 1855 by a slave owner named Moses Carver, and was taken back to a farm just outside of Diamond, Missouri. The elderly Moses Carver was by all accounts against slavery, but as the aging owner of a 240-acre farm, eventually gave in to the practice. Nine years later, Mary would give birth to a son she named George on that very farm. But it wouldn't be long before they were thrust into danger. Just a week after George was born, he, his mother, and his sister were kidnapped from the Carver farm by a roaming band of raiders that traveled throughout Missouri during the Civil War. The family was resold in Kentucky, but at this point, they had grown very close to Moses Carver, who quickly hired a neighbor to try and track them down. But the neighbor was only able to locate George, as the three of them had quickly been been split up when they were resold. Moses bought George back by trading his finest horse for the baby, bringing George back to Missouri. Moses and his wife Susan went on to raise George and his brother James, who hadn't been kidnapped in the raid, as if they were their own children, teaching the boys how to read and write. But while James would give up on his studies, preferring the work around the farm, George didn't even have the option of going out into the fields, spending the majority of his youth extremely sick and frail. Instead, he spent much of his time with Susan, who taught him how to cook, garden, and create simple herbal medicines. Extremely early on, George took a great interest in the plants of the garden, experimenting with natural pesticides, fungicides, and soil conditioners. Locals around the community would refer to him as the plant doctor because of his apparent gift in discerning how to improve the health and yield of their gardens, fields, and orchards. As early as age 11, George, who previously identified himself as Carver's George, came to call himself George Carver and had the support of Moses and Susan to leave the farm and attend an all-black school in a nearby town, as those in Diamond were white only. He was taken in by a black couple there who gave him a roof over his head while he attended the school in exchange for his help with the household chores, though his time at the school wouldn't turn out to be fruitful. Given that the slaves had only been freed just years earlier, many were uneducated with the local communities refusing to give the school proper funding or teachers that could teach George things that Susan hadn't already taught him. Over the next two years, he moved from city to city throughout the Midwest, putting himself through different schools and surviving off the skills Susan had taught him, eventually graduating from a high school in Minneapolis, Kansas in 1880. Immediately after this, he applied to a local college, and although he was initially accepted immediately, once he showed up and they saw the color of his skin, they rejected him. Despite this setback, he continued working to survive, seeking out higher education, eventually finding Simpson College, a Methodist school that admitted all qualified applicants regardless of the color of their skin. Once enrolled, he initially studied art and piano, thinking it might be his best chance at a teaching role. But he was discouraged from taking this path by one of his professors who knew about his lifelong interest in plants and flowers, encouraging him to apply to the Iowa State Agricultural School to study botany. And in 1894, Carver became the first African American in history to earn a Bachelor of Science degree. His professors were so impressed by his research throughout his time there that they asked him to stay on for graduate studies. Over the next few years, Carver continued his research, and in 1896, after earning his Master's of Agriculture degree, immediately received several job offers. Of these job offers, he chose to go with Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee Institute, where they worked to establish an agricultural school. Carver would run this school and stay at Tuskegee Institute for the rest of his life. But his time there was not without its own problems. Since the Institute's purpose was to apply scientific research to the farms around Alabama and beyond, it involved meeting with farmers and educating them on how they might better their crop quality and yield. But many Southern farmers believed they already knew the proper way to farm and often viewed schooling as a means of escaping farming, not complementing it. Carver also struggled with the demands of starting up a department, spending part of his time researching ways to help farmers, but also managing the school's two farms, teaching, ensuring that the school's faculties worked properly, and sitting on multiple committees. 
Although it had once been his goal, George often found himself resenting the amount of teaching that he was required to do, though Booker T. Washington was often the one telling him he was required to do it, causing the two men to butt heads very often. But this would change in 1915 when Washington passed away, succeeded by Robert Moton, who helped relieve Carver of all the duties he felt were a distraction from his most impactful work, including that of teaching. Although he had already taught farmers many useful things by this time, his research into crop rotation would become one of the most impactful, learning through his experiments that growing cotton year after year in the South had depleted the nutrients in the soil, reducing the yield from the crops. But there was a solution. By growing nitrogen-fixing plants like peanuts and soybeans, the soil could be restored, allowing yields to increase when reverted back to cotton in later years. To further help more farmers, including those too poor to make it to his lectures, he developed a horse-drawn classroom and laboratory that could be taken from town to town to demonstrate how the process worked. But even crop rotation had its own issues, and the burden to resolve them would once again fall on Carver. You see, while farmers loved getting higher yields of cotton on the years that they grew it in their rotations, they were now finding themselves with high amounts of other crops that they grew with no real way to sell them, especially peanuts. Carver took it upon himself to create new products for the peanuts and other crops to be used in. For example, he invented numerous products produced from sweet potatoes, things like flour and vinegar, but also inedible products like dyes, paints, and even ink for writing. But the crop he would find the most uses for was peanuts. In total, he developed more than 300 different uses for the peanuts, from food to industrial to commercial products, ranging from milk, cooking oils, papers, soaps, wood stains, and even attempting peanut-based laxatives. For a more complete list of the many creations he developed, I'll leave a link in the description to the official list maintained by Tuskegee University. Many of these peanut applications didn't find widespread use, but they were still very impactful regardless. In 1921, Carver appeared before the Ways and Means Committee of the United States House of Representatives on behalf of the peanut industry, which was seeking tariff protection at the time. He described the wide range of products that could be made from peanuts, which not only earned him a standing ovation, but also convinced the committee to approve a highly protective tariff. And from then on, he became known as the Peanut Man. In the last two decades of his life, Carver lived as a minor celebrity, but his focus was always on helping people. He moved throughout the South, hoping to improve race relations, and he even traveled to India to discuss nutrition in developing nations with Gandhi. Up until the year of his death, he also released bulletins for the public. Some of the bulletins reported on research findings, but there were others that were more practical in nature and included cultivation information for farmers, science for teachers, and recipes for housewives. Carver died on January 5, 1943, at Tuskegee University after falling down the stairs of his home. He was 78 years old and was buried next to Booker T. Washington on the Tuskegee Institute grounds. In his later years, he was quoted as saying, How far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and strong, because someday in your life you will have been all of these. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.